With me today, I have Lucy Moore um, from Claire de Rouen Bookshop in London. Um, I'm going to put a few questions to you today, Lucy, um, on the topic of um, the role you think you feel your um, traditional uh, publishing plays in today's digital age. But before that, I'd like to um, ask you how you feel, um, well, how would you define yourself and uh, the bookshop Claire de Rouen? Um, well, Claire de Rouen opened in 2005, uh, and it was opened by a woman called Claire de Rouen. Uh, she, she'd spent many years um, working in the book and photography world, and she decided to open her own shop in 2005 and launched it with a new book by Bruce Weber. Um, her, her areas of interest were fashion and photography, and she specialised in um, bringing in new books from all over the world, often long before anyone else had them, uh, getting signed books, signed by photographers and fashion designers, uh, very special uh, limited edition books, artist books, um, micro-publishing, so self-published books that maybe um, weren't available everywhere, uh, and, uh, and magazines as well from all over all over the world and uh, I took over the shop about two years ago after Claire uh, died um, and I was very keen to carry on these this emphasis um, but I also introduced some um, extra elements to the bookshop that were that are sort of based on my own um, previous experience so um, I introduced a program of events um, book launches and signings, but also um, talks, lectures and film screenings, reading groups, uh, things like that. And I've begun to stock artist books as well and, um, and to publishers as well. So I've just published a first book under the Claire de Rouen imprint and then I'm working on another one for next year. And, um, but we, we continue the the emphasis on fashion and photography also that Claire had established. Um, and for me, in terms of my history, I, I've studied um, architecture and history of art and also fine art and worked as an artist before, before taking, taking over the bookshop. And now that's my main occupation, is running Claire de Rouen. Right, thank you. Um, in today's digital age, um, how do you view the role and value, um, I suppose, of uh, traditionally published material? Well, I think um, it's very interesting because it's, I don't think one will kind of usurp the other. I don't think digital is going to completely take over um, physical books, books on paper. Um, but what's happening is that we're starting to understand more that certain types of knowledge or information, like that, that might be text or image based, or um, are better disseminated in in very in the di different ways. So some are better um, online, than, and some make more sense when they're in in physical books. Um, so we're kind of learning to understand uh, the qualities of the two different media, um, and refine our approach based on those different qualities. So what I mean is that um, books, for example, uh, have this capacity to um, uh, reveal certain physical um, physical qualities like the, the paper type that you choose. So you might, if you're making a book, you can, you can make something glossy or you can make it on newsprint or you can make it um, on see-through paper or you can print onto plastic or um, or make something um, very sort of um, fragile or something very hard wearing. So all those specifics of paper or print the surface you print on can be used to kind of put, put ideas across. So that's one example. Um, <coughs> things like distribution. So when you put something online or you make an e-book or an e- or a, you published a magazine online, um, generally it's going to be accessible far more widely um, and um, more immediately, I guess, um, and, and in many cases 
less, more, more sort of inexpensively. So it might be free or, or not very much money to buy. Um, on the other hand, you know, you need a computer or a iPhone or a tablet or whatever. Um, you also need electricity, um, and uh, and there's and there's sometimes sometimes that kind of um, incredible abundance of information is really positive and exciting. And sometimes it's nicer to um, make it more specific. So with a book, you can. Um, or, 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 or artists, for example, might make an artwork that they choose to put in, into a book or into a newspaper, and then you're affecting its reception through that, through um, the distribution process. So you might, as an artist, you might make a um, text work and you might put it in a newspaper, and you know that people are only really going to have 24 hours to read it or notice it before it's probably going to be thrown <coughs> away or recycled. or. Um, and so sometimes that kind of um, those qualities to do with distribution can be really interesting to, to use with books. Um, and then the other thing that I often think is um, very beautiful about books and magazines that are made physically is that um, there's a sequencing that you can really control. So you can you can control. Um, well, you can of course someone can start at the back if they want to, <laughs> but. Um, you know, if you make a book, it definitely has a beginning and a middle and an end. An end, and um, that's a very different experience to using a computer and maybe having six programs open and you know six little windows and um, scrolling through reams and reams of text. You just have a very different relationship to the the information and the images. Um, so I think that's kind of what's happening is that there's a there's just a refinement of the use of these media, because we're aware that there are other options, digital or, or physical printing. So, yeah. Thanks for that. It was quite illuminating. Um, <laughs> not really. Um, OK. So, well, I guess that question and your response is kind of linked to where um, I'm going with this question. But taking into consideration an objective, I suppose an academic objective, to uh, provoke individual thought and vision um, through a deep and personalised um, engagement with the research process. Do you think that the particular uh, physical engagement with physical material um, offers something uniquely beneficial um, mm. that you can highlight as something uh, um, quite apart from how people engage with with the digital content, and I think you've already, in your in the in previous questions, started to answer that question. But is there anything that you think might we might be losing, um, particularly young people not engaging with? I think it? there's a real um, there's a real strength in both types of research, but I think I guess it's important to remember that. Um, the digital world has not been around for that long, and there's still there's still a huge um, number of books which haven't been published online, um, and the text from which or the images within them are not available online. So, you know, when people come to my bookshop, for example, they often find things which you you can't find on the internet, um, and um, so that's kind of. That's one just important sort of basic thing to remember, I think. Um, but uh, the other, um, the other thing that's that's quite can be really exciting, I think, is that um, if you're if you're producing something um, with you know that's with a with a clear set of intentions and you want to communicate certain ideas through, you know, through um, in a on, in a project, um, what you can do in terms of you can do this with a digital media as well, but with print media, there's such a long history of production that you can draw upon and relate your work to um, in a really subtle um, and kind of interesting ways. So, you know, if you look to the history of um, making pamphlets, for example, like little, you know, political pamphlets that kind of started, you know, were 
were made and were really powerful in, say, um, the 16th century. Um, you can draw on that um, that history, that language um, now in the present. And so, like, I'm thinking, for example, of um, there's a magazine that's published from in Singapore by um, an art director called Theseus Chan, and it's called Work. Um, w e r k, work with an e. And one of the issues that um, he made, which was actually a kind of offshoot for Comme de Gasson, um, called Gorilla Zine. Um, it was it's it's a paper, you know, it's a it's a thick sort of paper magazine, and it had on the front it had a little notice that was physically was nailed into the magazine with actual nails, and so it drew on that language of. Um, of political pamphlets, which but pretty much are about telling people something that's kind of a bit more radical, something that's radical that might challenge their um, currently held views. And so you can, so that's just one example of, of you know, many that so of, of drawing on the language of paper to, to put ideas across. Um, similarly, you can do, you know, things like um, exploring scale is something that you can't can't do um, online. You can't really tell people, you know, you're not allowed to read this on an iPhone or something. So, you know, someone might look at something on a tiny, tiny scale when actually you want them to see it really big. Um, I've seen some really beautiful new magazines recently that are, are extra large in their format. And um, I think that's really an exciting area of research in terms of putting together a project. Um, and then the other thing is that um, I think, you know, something you were also kind of interested in was that process of, of um, doing research w involving um, drawing on other people's knowledge. So if you go to a, a library or a bookshop, um, you can, if you go to a specialist bookshop or a specialist library, then the people you'll meet in there know a lot about what's, what's in there and they can show you things that you just, you know, you just probably would find it much harder to discover on your own. So um, that, I think that's, those are the sort of, those are really valuable kind of aspects of. Yeah, absolutely. And also just thinking about what can happen in that um, contact with people, how um, <clears throat> it's not formatted, so it's quite spontaneous. Mm. Um, so on one day you might offer um, um, or follow a particular path of uh, um, uh, uh, engagement with your with your visitors and, and another day depending on I don't know what what's affected your thought process during that morning or that afternoon mm. and I think that kind of uh, degree of uh, unpredictability actually offers something you, you know quite valuable yeah where things can get a little bit standardized and formatted and completely um, uh, um, predictable online um, so that's also something that I try to every day to um, make students aware of that it's the unpredictable that often reveals things that uh, you know yeah. are quite essential. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the other thing is people meet each other a lot mm. in, in at Claire de Rouen. Um, they bump into each other. And that's, you know, collaboration is is yeah. um, is a is a wonderful thing. And so um, you know I have I've seen people get sort of meet in the bookshop and then go off for, for lunch together, you know, and then maybe start working on something together. So um, that's, that's a big part of it as well, is, is the, you know, these, is your community of, of creative people is kind and of important to be a part of. Linked to that, would you say that you're also, um, maybe you have some kind of strategy for um, maybe keeping things like micro, publishing alive? I mean, would you see uh, what you do as um, being responsible for, for that in some way or being...? Yeah, I, de I think I, I meet a lot of um, photographers and artists and designers come into the shop with um, publications that they've made themselves and um, that's the kind of, you know, those, those things that are made on release in, on a small scale mm inexpensively kind of in your studio or something there those those things are kind of the the very very beginnings of 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 potentially you know 
um, much more expansive um, worlds. And I guess I do find that really exciting, these kind of very initial, like these things that happen right at the beginning of, of someone's artistic life or creative life. And, um, and I definitely, yeah, I think I, people come, you know, come to me to buy, to buy these things and to see what's going on. And um, it's very sort of cutting edge in a way because it takes, you know, a little published scene doesn't take long to make or doesn't have to, you know. Um, and so they're really immediate often. And so, and I, yeah, I feel it's really important to um, make those publications available um, in, in a, in the context of a of a bookshop that also has um, stock that's much more um, you know might be sort of already quite rare or yeah. kind of part of a can a canon um, and to kind of acknowledge that the two are related that what's new now will you know will become um, will lead the way um, mm. and uh, yeah um, I think a lot of my yeah a lot of my customers understand that too. So yeah, it's exciting to be sort of part of that, definitely. Would you say most of, most of your customers come with that informed um, viewpoint or perspective, um, knowing what your bookshop's about and having a certain expectation or? A lot of them do, but um, equally some people just discover it mm -hmm. and come in and are just very curious to, to to learn more, and um, and that's something that I really like doing as well, um, introducing people to new new things. Um, so yeah, it's a kind of mixture really, and and um, there are a lot of a lot of people come in for research purposes from advertising or fashion, um, and then a lot of people just have their own personal interest in um, photography or or bookmaking. Um, and then students come in as well for for research and inspiration. So there's a big mix, really, of people. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, talking about students, convincing students to visit bookshops and engage with hard copy books and magazines is becoming increasingly difficult. Um, okay. So we've kind of just discussed this, but what types of uh, what types of people visit your bookshop, um, and how do they use it? And I think you've kind of pretty much covered that, unless. Anything yeah, but I, I guess I'd say that um, it's really important to look at uh, printed publications uh, because they, they n not only are they kind of particular in the ways that I described earlier, you know, their size, their scale, paper, um, printing quality, distribution, all those things, but they're also, and, and they're beautiful objects as well, um, but they also do. Um, there are ideas in, 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 in them that just aren't online, so you have to, you have to look at both. Um, and I think that's, that's kind of um, demonstrated by the kinds of people that come to buy books from me and magazines. Um, so they're people also like very much at the top of their field um, who, uh, who, you know, designers, for example, have dedicated research days where they'll go around London going to big bookshops and buying books and magazines. So, you know, that's kind of scheduled into their working year. Uh, so it's, as equally, they, you know, I know one photographer who has one day every two weeks where he just spends it on um, Tumblr. So that you need, it's really important to kind of understand that the two are really different and you need to look at both mm. um, to kind of understand exactly what's going on. Tumblr yeah. day. Yeah, Tumblr day. <laughs> 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 um, okay, uh, I think we can move on to six. Um, on the topic of fashion then, um, beyond reportage, do you think that hard copy publications offer a sensory and or intellectualised um, quality that contributes something additional, um, critical maybe, to the development of fashion experience and culture? And I'm really think, um, thinking about how um, for example, the, um, if we're looking at uh, published material and the aesthetics of published, mat uh, pu published material and how um, physical content can offer you a platform to um, project 
and message ideas, which you, you talked about mm. earlier. Mm. Um, is that does that change, or is that lessened in any way um, online? If you if considering that you can't, there's a very dif different sense of ownership with anything that you might be viewing or or buying online. Um, Whereas seeking out um, or finding or discovering um, a publication in whatever format that has a very, um, you know, a very specific physical presence, does that create uh, a very special and, and unique platform for engagement with the material that you think um, doesn't exist online? You well, I think there's that? still, yeah, I mean, there, as I said, there, I think there are still. Uh, magazines that are printed magazines are still offering something um, that's different to what to what's online. So if you look at, for example, like if you look at Pop magazine, the magazine itself has different content to its to its online world, um, and they're both wonderful, but they are different. So um, I think it's Im important to recognise that, but and also that. You know, historically, if you think of style press, um, you know, pre-internet, the magazine was like um, a kind of passport to a different world, and mm. um, the fashion world, and it was a fashion thing, definitely, and the fashion world still still has like a love of that um, experience of, you know, once a month going to get your copy of of whatever magazine that you know you love or once every six months and um, but the other thing that I think is super important is that you know if you're working in fashion which is which is a, a physical thing at the end of the day you know m fabrics mm. have texture and reflect light and make noises and you know fit around your body um, then um, things which are printed um, can communicate those ideas much more intelligently than a screen, of which we always know is going to be flat and shiny and um, a certain, you know, certain size and a certain shape as well. And so, you know, if you're if you're making something, if you want to make a publication about pattern cutting, then it maybe you don't want it to be square, you know. So <laughs> that it just offers all these other ways of communicating, which are which digital uh, media doesn't don't doesn't have. That's not to say that um, digital spaces kind of offers many other wonderful things, but the two are complementary. And so I think, um, I do think fashion will, will continue to embrace paper because it's, it just has such a close relationship to the, to the medium of fashion itself, any of clothes. Um, and, uh, um, you know, you can, if you look at designers like, um, you know, I guess, Really, obviously, Shalayan, or um, for example, you know, or um, Yamamoto, or uh, that whether there are those references are quite literal. Um, you'll see it there. But um, even Lagerfeld and his, you know, enormous library is just kind of testament to to yeah. the fashion fashion's um, love of, of paper. So, um, yeah, I think. I don't think it's dying. <laughs> no, no, no. I well, think it's I getting stronger, actually. Yeah, so. and it it seems to me that also in in that is um, uh, a kind of element of speed. Things are done differently with how uh, people engage with the content in terms of speed, and mm. like, there's a slower process with uh, yeah, analog, if you like, or, or, or you know, physical content engaging with physical content and maybe yeah. it encourages people to um, just spend more time with with the content um, and just spend more time allowing themselves more time to think yeah. about things that they're, they're um, um, encountering whereas online um, and you know I see this every day with students um, they'll be directed to something or they'll discover something and immediately, as you say, they might have ten or you know, five or six or seven windows open at the same time and the content's kind of fighting for, you know, <laughs> for attention. Yeah. Um, and also, so there's, all, there's a kind of reduction in the amount of time that students spend looking at digital content, usually, um, not exclusively. 
Um, so would you agree that maybe that the physical process slows things down, allows people to engage with content a bit more deeply, or is that a myth? Yeah, well, I don't know what a kind of um, the brain of a of an 18 year old is like anymore you know I'm <laughs> I can only I can only speak for myself but I I enjoy I enjoy spending time with things um, in a sl in a slower right. with 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 uh, some depth and slowness um, I find often for example if I read something and and then um, I, f I might one week later um, look at it again and then maybe one week later I'll I'll something uh, I'll understand there's a relationship between that and then something else that I've just read but that that process is quite slow yeah. but it's quite refined and I find that a really productive way of uh, really developing ideas okay here's a here's a short one for you your personal interest in fashion uh, how would you describe it right, well I love clothes of course um, I think I'm I'm particularly interested in um, I, I, one thing that I really love about fashion is its um, enthusiasm and um, capacity to absorb uh, histories and um, or references uh, and uh, aesthetics, and then sort of remodel them. I find that really um, fantastic. Uh, but uh, yeah, and uh, I'm also. Um, I guess I'm interested in fashion's relationship to uh, to uh, feminism and uh, the ideas around identity and to technology as well and um, and also kind of crucially I think um, you know ethics and sustainability and um, and even politics now you know um, uh, you know. Uh, so yeah, actually, it's a bit of a long answer. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. But that's really interesting. Um, but would you would you say that we're at a particular particularly interesting time for um, how fashion is being influenced by and influencing all of those things that you you mentioned, um, particularly the notion of um, femininity today? I don't um, think it's any more critical than it has been previously. You know, fashion has always been innately related to um, notions of sort of gender and um, identity and sort of how we perform in our li in our daily lives um, but I think uh, for me it's just something interesting to to kind of observe personally and mm. um, and uh, and I think designers are really aware of it too, and I find the different approaches really interesting. I mean, I think that one of the things now at the moment that's kind of interesting is this use of we're beginning to see models um, modeling both men's and women's yeah. wear, and um, I love that. You know, I, f I think that's just really brilliant uh, in terms just just because it's it is beginning to break down those some of those. Um, uh, distinctions um, yeah. and it's more playful as well you know I think and that's another thing that's great about fashion it's always been it's a playful thing uh, it's fun so <laughs> would you say that that's that sends out a message of um, inclusiveness because I'm 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 personally particularly interested in how um, recent in recent years uh, there's a lot of things impacting upon the mainstream um, mainstream in general, particularly mainstream fashion, and, and how um, particularly uh, high-level fashion, luxury fashion, if you like, isn't really using uh, the word um, exclusive anymore um, in describing um, you know, their, their company ethos or philosophy, mm. and they're trying to find new ways of um, articulating um, their updated um, revised philosophies uh, in a more inclusive way mm. um, and m all of the things I think that you mentioned earlier impact on that and um, so I guess if there is a question there 
it's whether you you feel that you've seen any movement in there towards fashion being um, more democratic or more inclusive, particularly at the at the high end, which traditionally um, defined itself by being exclusive. Yeah, um, I think I think we're at the moment just uh, sort of politically, it's not um, it's not a time when people want to be showing off very much. Right. So the word exclusive is perhaps not very fashionable at the moment. Um, but uh, I think, uh, you know, I, I don't, you could, I, perhaps it seems, it seems maybe that it's more inclusive on the surface, but mm. having, you know, said, okay, it's, it does feel as if barriers are being broken down. I, I would, on the other hand, I would say there are still many kind of, um, many kind of criteria that need to be adhered to in the fashion world. And um, um, I don't, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what, if you dig deeper how, um, how, you know, whether anything is really changing substantially. Uh, but we, you know, it's, it's driven by economics a lot of the time, I think. And we are, you know, seeing much more, um, much more business, you know, in Asia and um, Russia, and so there's a kind of necessity anyway for for um, fashion to begin looking um, looking outward a little more. So it's it's perhaps that's like a little bit of a cynical answer, but I think it's it is market driven a lot of the time. Um, not not in all cases, but sometimes. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay um, well, lastly. Um, do you have any advice for uh, students on how to initiate a meaningful relationship with, with books and bookshops? Um, I, uh, I think, you know, it should start from um, something that you already love. Um, and you can look them up online and see if there are any, what, well, you know, what's been published. Um, and you know, probably begin to discover that there are really specific things that um, um, are made because because books have have a kind of ability to um, they have these qualities that are very special to to, to books or to, to the printed page um, and so I guess yeah start from your sort of inspirations and um, uh, Go to go to bookshops, or or even you know online. There are loads of great um, independent bookshops that have online shops, um, and so you can access, you can buy, you can buy things from from anywhere really. Um, but uh, yeah, and maybe like it's nice to start collecting like one thing, like one magazine that you really love. Then you can begin to understand um, how each issue changes and how it's maintains a certain sort of philosophy and then it just, yeah, becomes kind of even more exciting, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, thank you for that. Thanks, Lucy. Thanks, Colin.